The concept of data communications has been there since time immemorial, although the items being transferred were perhaps called messages. There are many examples, such as the human runners carrying messages, or pigeons flying with messages tied to their feet, or messages in bottles set afloat in the high seas, and till more recently, the pony express riders that townsfolk awaited eagerly. An evolution of these systems was the telegraph messaging method, which used the Morse code signal to transmit data between far-flung locations. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell proved how electric signals could be used to even transmit voice messages along telephone lines. This paved the way for a second data communication system or telecommunication channel. In today's day and age, much of our message communication takes place via postal mail and computers. In some cases, the messages take time to reach the destination, while in some cases, they appear to reach instantly. You may recall examples of online and interactive processing areas, example, airline booking, where input data is captured by computers at the point where data is generated. Such processes involve data stations located at or near the data sources, which can be far away from the processor that will actually process the data. The question is, how is data being instantly transferred to the processor? The links are provided by data communications, which are the means and methods for transferring data between data entry stations and the central processor. By about the mid-1900s, a complex network of telecommunication systems had been established to link locations throughout the world. Although preliminary attempts were being made to converge communications concepts with computing, it was not until the late 1950s that the computer communications linkage gathered momentum. Starting with its application to airline reservation systems, computing communications usage has grown steadily since then. Today, terminals and workstations scattered across the land are in constant communication with the processors housed in minis and larger computers. Also, with the attachments available for personal computers, independent users are able to use the telecommunication channels to link up with information retrieval services, banks and electronic bulletin boards. Until about two decades ago, computing capability was obtainable from computer vendors and communication services was available from telecommunication firms. With the growing communications needs and advances in hardware technology, this distinction amongst vendors has gradually become blurred. Computer vendors began offering a larger package of communication services to their customers, while telecommunication suppliers furnished more computer resources to those who used their networks. Today, one of the largest names in data computing and communications technology is AT&T, a subsidiary of the original Bell Telephones. It is evident that computers are a vital part of the modern communications network and such a network is vital to the operation of many modern computer-based information systems. Many of the same electronic circuit chips are now used in both computing and communication devices. As more computers get attached to communication networks and more organizations get linked via communication channels, the distinction between computing and communications will get even more ambiguous. Any communication is possible only when the communicating parties meet with the appropriate handshake and use the same language. In data communication systems, workstations and other input-output devices are connected with one or more processors to capture input data and receive output information. This connection is possible through interface elements comprising hardware and software elements that provide the bridge between the different operating environments of these input-output devices and processors. Since much of the world was linked via telephone lines that allowed only voice-based analog signals, a special gadget called a modem had to be used for computing communications. The modem is a modulation, demodulation device that can handle this two-way communication. 
The modulation unit converts the discrete streams of digital on-off pulses used by computers into the continuous variable analog wave patterns used to transmit human voice. While the demodulation unit receives the analog signals and reconverts them back into digital data. Modems need to be directly wired to the input-output devices at both the central and remote locations. There are two kinds of modems. External modems, which have their own cabinets and are known as the external direct connect modems. Internal modems, which are available in the form of plug-in circuit boards and have to be installed within the PCs that are designed to support them. Some modems are intelligent modems, which are programmed to directly perform the dialing, answering and disconnecting functions. Over the years, the escalating need to transmit huge volumes of data across countries and continents have led to research in the field of all digital transmissions. This will be possible over lines that support digital signals and hence will do away with the need for modems. Data communication channels which provide the highway for data transfer can be classified into three types. Narrow band, like telegraph lines, which support very slow transfer rates of 5 to 30 characters per second or CPS. Voice band, like the standard telephone lines that allow up to 1000 CPS. Broadband, as used in satellite communications, microwave links and coaxial cables that allow up to 100,000 CPS. The wider the bandwidth, the larger the data volumes that can be transmitted in a given period of time. Generally, organizations with lower volumes of data transfer use the dial-up telephone switching network belonging to the PNT to call the processor for entering data. However, Firms with massive volumes of data transfer require a dedicated or leased line belonging exclusively to them that can be used for data and voice transmissions. The medium or material used for these lines has also been undergoing technological improvement. Earlier days saw the use of twisted pair cables and coaxial cables which were made of a pair or groups of specially wrapped and insulated wires respectively. Microwave technology uses no wires but the space to transmit data through very high frequency radio signals. If data is beamed to a communication satellite, the antennae acts as a reflector by accepting data from one point on the earth and reflecting it to some other location. The most recently used medium is that of fiber optic cables and laser technology to transmit data as light signals through very thin threads of glass or plastic. A single glass fiber, as thin as human hair, can transmit as much as a dozen books with thousand pages each in just one second. Since many such threads can be grouped together into a single cable, the future cost of broadband data communication will be reduced and within the means of most organizations. Apart from the difference in medium, different types of circuits can also be used to meet the need of different people or organizations. Simplex circuits allow the flow of data only in one direction, so that a terminal connected to such a circuit is either a send only or receive only device. Due to this limitation, simplex circuits are rarely used since most communications require acknowledgement. Duplex circuits allow the flow of data in both directions. There are two types of duplex circuits. Half duplex circuits which can alternately send or receive data and full duplex circuits which can simultaneously send or receive data and is much faster. Since distances being covered are large, data signals are received, amplified and retransmitted by each station along the route. ISDN or Integrated Services Digital Network is an international standards body that is performing the function of linking nations with interconnected digital webs that can handle large volumes of data communications. You now know that data transmission takes place through communication lines. The question that now arises is, to whom do these lines belong? The most common large public telephone and telegraph networks are offered for use by common carriers.
In the US, these include the local and regional facilities of the seven Bell Telephone Operating Companies, the long distance network of the AT&T Communication Division and MCI Communications Corporation, and the networks maintained by General Telephone and Electronics and Western Union. In addition to these common carriers that offer a wide range of facilities, there are specialized common carriers whose public networks are often restricted to a more limited number of services. Included in the specialized carrier category are one international system and other US-based domestic systems. Other than common carriers, there is the category of value-added carriers. These carriers offer specialized services, but they do not have their own transmission facilities. GTE Telnet and Timnet both have communication networks that receive customer data coming in over the common carrier telephone line. The data is temporarily stored and organized into packets of characters, which are then computer-routed and transmitted through carrier channels to various offices. This method of transmission is called packet switching. The packets of data originating at one point are efficiently routed through different network of lines and then reassembled in the original order when they reach the destination. The transmission cost of a value-added network is often lesser than directly utilizing dedicated leased lines on common carrier channels. In the early 1980s, AT&T's communications monopoly split up giving rise to the independent but AT&T regulated Bell operating companies, bringing hundreds of new vendors into what had been once a single supplier marketplace, and a flood of new and innovative products and services. This explosion of innovative products and services has left the user market stunned by confusion. Some users of these services utilize all digital leased lines from local and long distance companies and adopt other new services that public carriers are offering. Other users bypass the public network facilities of traditional local lines or long distance systems and establish their own private network. Such organizations are labeled as do-it-yourself carriers. They employ the bypass networks approach by using cable TV lines, microwave networks, fiber optic connections, or satellite facilities offered by privately owned teleport firms. A teleport is a place where communications traffic is concentrated, sorted, and dispatched to other local, national, and international points. Having created the service bypass approach, these do-it-yourself carriers not only handle their own communications needs, but can also sell time on their private networks to other firms. However, not all the routing of data can be done by the bypass method, and these organizations still have to rely on the common carriers and public networks somewhere in the communications maze. The transformation of simple data communication systems to very large computing and communicating networks made it necessary to have intricately designed coordinating systems for efficient network use. Large networks typically may have hundreds of workstations and many small workstations located at dozens of dispersed locations, which in turn may be linked by different transmission channels to larger computers. The main goal of network designers is to select and coordinate the network components so that the necessary data is moved to the right place at the right time with a minimum of errors and at the lowest possible cost. The coordination of these complex networks is handled by a number of communication processors. The communication processors perform the following functions. Concentration of messages involves Receiving terminal input from many low-speed lines and then concentrating and transmitting a compressed and smooth stream of data on a higher speed and more efficient transmission channel. This job of concentration is handled by two kinds of devices called remote concentrators and multiplexers. Earlier multiplexers tended to be less expensive than concentrators but were not flexible since they were not programmable. Nowadays, People use microprocessor-equipped multiplexers that function like concentrators. Message switching involves 
Receiving and analyzing data messages from points in the network. Determining the destination and the proper routing. Forwarding the message to other network locations. And if necessary, storing the message until an outgoing line is available. The processor used for all these functions is called a message switcher. Then, there are the front-end processors whose main function is to provide relief to the main or host computer. Front-end processors are usually located at the site of the central computer and they take on all those host computer functions that require it to interact with and control the communications network. There is no distinct line of functions among these communication processors. They not only differ from one network to another, there may also be an overlapping of functions. One communications processor may perform the dual functions of message switching as well as remote concentration. Likewise, a front-end processing computer may perform message switching functions. And in less complete networks, the host computer may perform all of the functions of the front-end processors. Until now, you have been viewing data communications needs on a global scale with data transmissions taking place between different towns, cities and countries. However, data communications needs can be limited to the requirements of a single entity like an office or university campus or a factory complex. In such cases, Data transfers are restricted between computers, workstations and other devices which are located within a compact, geographically defined area. These entities use the system of physically linking its workstations and computers via a communication system called a local area network or LAN. A LAN is wholly owned by the organization that is using it and the arrangement of computers within the network can take any of the three forms, star, bus or ring. The star LAN arrangement has a central controller with links to all other network stations radiating out from this central node like the points of a star. The bus LAN arrangement has a single long cable that is routed from station to station to provide the network linkage like the alternate seating arrangement of an aisle in the bus. In the ring LAN arrangement, each network computer or resource is linked in a circular fashion to form a circle, like the stones arranged along a jeweled ring. The actual wiring or transmission channel used would be anything from a twisted pair of cables to coaxial cables or even fiber optic cables. LANs use special hardware and software elements in place of modems and outside telephone lines. While the cost and speed factors generally depend on the type of LAN used, one can attempt to categorize LAN on the following basis. High speed networks. These are used in mainframe networks and allow speeds of up to 20 million bits per second or Mbps. Medium speed networks are used in smaller mainframes, minis and PCs and allow speeds of 3 to 20 Mbps. Low speed networks are used for PCs and workstations and allow speeds that are lower than 3 Mbps. Low speed digital PBX networks are usually arranged in a star configuration and handle voice as well as data transmissions at low speed. Most organizations adopting LAN technology will additionally have the profile of a LAN manager to ensure that data integrity and security is maintained. While microcomputers provide people with personal processing capability, mainframes hold many billions of bytes of data important to an organization that may at some time be required by micro-users. Attempts have been made by micro-users to devise ways by which they can get mainframe data, extract the facts they need and store it in their PCs. These facts can then be manipulated and analyzed by regular PC application software. Micro to mainframe links are the combination of hardware and software communication products that allow microcomputers to connect to larger systems like mainframes and minis. Today, a whole array of such linkage products is available to choose from. Some are plug-in circuit boards that are inserted into the PC's expansion slots. 
With the complementary software, these circuit boards allow the PC to communicate with the mainframe as if it were a terminal. These terminal emulator products allow for simple transfer between PC files and selected mainframe application files, but they usually require the PC users to be familiar with the access procedures of the larger systems. Other products provide a compact coupling of mainframe software from specific vendors with PC application software from the same vendors. Research in data communication techniques is tending towards developing advanced linkage products that will automatically handle conversion of data to and from the many incompatible formats used with PCs and larger systems. You are already familiar with many applications that support online data communication. Example, airline reservation systems, banking, etc. A real-time processing system is in a parallel time relationship with an ongoing activity and is producing information quickly enough to be used in controlling this current live activity. Hence, the phrase real-time describes an interactive processing system with severe time limitations. While a real-time system always uses interactive processing, an interactive system may not be operating in real-time. This is because real-time systems require immediate transaction input from all input originating terminals, files are updated each minute, and inquiries are answered by split-second access to up-to-the-minute records. Interactive systems may rely upon periodic or daily input transaction and file updation. In real-time systems, the stations are connected directly by high-speed telecommunication lines to one or more processors and several of these stations can operate at the same time. Meteorological systems, train and airline reservation systems, Military systems and air traffic control systems are a few examples of real-time processing systems. A time-sharing system is a system with a number of independent, relatively low-speed, online and simultaneously working stations. Each workstation has a direct access to the processor, but the processor addresses each station by turn. A special program allows the processor to switch from one station to the other and perform each job in an allocated time portion called a time slice until the job is completed. The time sharing process is usually so fast that the user feels as though nobody else is using the central processor. These computing communication setups offer a broad range of jobs that can be processed by third parties or the opportunity of service organizations to specialize in the needs of a particular group. Many firms sell time-sharing services to their customers. Other than this, many firms also offer remote computing services, also called service bureaus. Remote computing services usually accept input data from customers over telecommunication lines, do custom batch processing for the customer, and then transmit the customer's information back to the customer's terminal. Some of these services are offered to the clients online, whereby the client merely has to supply the input data, access the program on the bureau's computer, and get the desired result. The concept of time sharing is as old as the 1960s, when the relatively high costs of computer hardware spurred many hardware developers to then achieve economics by sharing the time of that system among many users. When one or two processors handle the workload of all the outlying terminals, the word time sharing may still be appropriate. However, when systems grew and geographically dispersed independent computer systems got connected and transmitted data, processed it and sent results between cooperating processors and terminals, the term time sharing became inadequate to encompass it all. Today, this extension of time sharing is called Distributed Data Processing or DDP. A DDP arrangement can be described as one that is able to place the required data along with the computing and communications resources necessary to process it at the end user's location. Naturally, an arrangement such as this may require many computers and significant software resources to be shared among dozens of users. 
Like a time sharing system, a DDP network may be used solely for a single organization or it may be available as a service for use by many organizations. There are many private DDP networks of which the Hewlett Packard Company and the Bank of America are conspicuous. DDP networks that are offered as a service to other organizations are the DARPA network and the Timeshare network. Some organizations have created data communication networks that can provide on-demand a wealth of information services to people at home. These typically require the consumer to attach a PC or a special terminal to their TV sets to receive the information. Two such services are teletext and videotext. A teletext system continuously transmits the information in one direction only and the information can only be received in the sequence of transmission on a TV set. A typical example is the textual banner of share script values that is continuously flashed throughout the day. A video text system is interactive, rich in graphics and more advanced. It has the facility to store a vast amount of graphic and alphanumeric information at a central computer facility. Receive customer requests for stored information over telephone lines and other channels. Retrieve the requested information and forward it electronically to customers who are equipped to receive it. Another system that has developed in the field of computing and communications is telecommuting. You may be aware that people need to access their computer services and databases from just about anywhere, from home or from tour locations or from their own office seat. It does seem impractical to think that every time one needs to access a database or a service, one has to go to the location of the central computer. This link of a computer from anywhere to the central computer is possible by telecommunication networks. Nowadays, many people prefer to do their work at home instead of commuting to their workplaces located far away. And the workstations of many people are not necessarily located within their office building. Telecommuting approaches allow people to enjoy flexible working hours and are particularly suited for those with physical challenges or familial responsibilities that tie one down to the house. Over the years, it is expected that most service sector business activities will be handled by millions of telecommuters who will operate out of electronic cottages that will deliver the results to end users or other sites.